and on behalf of the MIC, wanted to welcome you all to our um, research readout. So for the past few months now, um, we've been our, our research partner, Goodwin and Simon Strategic Research, and working hard um, to talk to um, Medicaid beneficiaries and others who are um, eligible for Medicaid um, in your states. Um, and the insights from this research is critical to our entire process. Um, we believe that uh, for this process to be meaningful, the voice of uh, Medicaid beneficiaries has to be front and center. Uh, we're not interested in finding um, solutions for problems that don't exist. We really want to make sure that the problems are the real problems. And so um, we're uh, really excited to hear um, and share with you what we learned um, over the last few months. Um, the other thing that we wanted to share while we've been doing this research, and, and uh, John's going to be going over this in detail, um, we also have um, kicked off a community advisory board, um, which is comprised of some individuals who are part of the research process and others that you helped us identify. So thank you for um, helping us um, with that. Uh, it's a great advisory panel from um, representation all across the states, and they're going to help us continue to provide feedback on the process, continue to make sure that um, both uh, the problems that we're uh, narrowing in on um, and the solutions um, are uh, based um, and have input from their experiences as well. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is first just um, uh, rooting us in the health equity priority um, that we're going to be discussing. Uh, we're going to have John and uh, the team from um, Goodwin Simon share the research findings um, our hope is that we'll have some discussion, and we really, really encourage you to drop questions into chat as you're hearing the findings. And then we're going to end with sharing how the research findings that you'll be hearing is rolling into the request for information or the application that we're going to be putting out to identify um, solutions and then hopefully be able to get some of your input as well. So that's what we have planned for the next hour. Um, and then on the next page, so um, as you all know, um, this year we're working on this broad concept of social determinants of health, really looking at um, this, you know, starting with this big umbrella term that's very well understood and, and looking to for ways to address those determinants. Um, ultimately, what we're hoping with this process is we are going to identify these tech-enabled solutions that are going to help um, close the gaps and really address these social needs. And um, we just uh, pulled this framework from a, a great health affairs article, but just helping us understand um, what we're uh, moving towards. So um, this research is, is key in helping us find that solutions. And it's very much based on talking to Medicare beneficiaries in New York, Iowa, Kentucky. We also have a little bit of qualitative research done from some of the folks we talked to in Nevada before. Unfortunately, Nevada had to drop out of the program, uh, but just wanted to be transparent about that. Um, and also wanted to thank you all um, who had given input on the questionnaire. It was uh, critical in helping us um, narrow in. So. So with that, um, wanted to strongly encourage you again to drop any questions into chat. We're going to take a couple pauses along the way to try and get to your questions. If for some reason we're not able to get to all of them, we will follow up with email after that. So with that, I wanted to um, hand it over to John uh, Whaley at the, um, and his, the, the team at Goodwin Simon Strategic Research who's been excellent partners, really a pleasure uh, to work with, uh, been extremely responsive and thoughtful about this process. Um, and um, we'll let you take it away, John. Thank you, Vinu, and thank you to the full uh, uh, team. Uh, Chris, uh, Aisha, this has been a very collaborative effort. And also I wanna echo Vinu's uh, thanks to folks that uh, weighed in on the uh, survey instrument, which was extremely helpful. I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Amy Simon, Amy Simon, our founding partner, and also uh, uh, my colleague, Andrea Hackle, um, who uh, was a key research analyst on this project. And they will likely jump in uh, and also try to field uh, questions in the chat uh, while the presentation is ongoing. 
Uh, as Vinu mentioned, I'll stop a couple of times so we can um, uh, just uh, make sure that uh, you get a chance to uh, ask questions. We'd love to hear your thoughts and observations. Uh, this is your area of expertise, so I'd really love to hear what, what you're thinking. Um, and so with that, I'm going to jump in to the research. So let me begin with methodology. So this was uh, a really kind of a comprehensive approach with qualitative and quantitative research. Um, but we began the qualitative with in-depth interviews where we could really hear um, in a one-on-one -on -one setting about the challenges that um, our participants are experiencing and their reactions to some of the solutions out there. Um, and so as Vinu pointed out, these are not just all beneficiaries. They're, we also included Medicaid eligible participants uh, and initially Nevada was included as well. Those in-depth interviews or IDIs took place in, um, in the fall and December. Um, and then we followed that up. And I should also just mention we did um, those IDIs and the focus groups we did among black, uh, and then we had separate groups for black, Hispanic, API, white, and then we did this two Hispanic um, uh, sessions, one in English, one in Spanish. Um, so there's 12 IDIs and then five focus groups uh, that we conducted earlier this year. And then that helped form the, the, the survey instrument um, uh, that we uh, then fielded uh, in uh, February. And that included um, 886 respondents, uh, again, both beneficiaries and Medicaid eligible respondents from Iowa, Kentucky, uh, and New York. Uh, um, we were only able to get you know, smaller numbers in some of the smaller states. Um, so we will show you the results by each state since the overall results would really just be dominated by New York. Um, and if you have questions about the methodology, please raise them in the chat and my colleagues will do their best or we can come back to them in the, in the Q&A. So I'll start with some, some broad findings. And what we saw clearly is that the struggles that our participants are facing are often very interrelated. Um, and so, um, First off, it's it's just it, the, the struggles they're facing are really extreme in terms of their ability to just pay for the very basics, food, housing, medical care, transportation, and you'll see some statistics on that when we get to the survey results. Um, but it's really hard for us to sort of um, focus on a certain uh, social determinant or social need because they're so interrelated. So if they are worried about their job, um, losing their job, then that's gonna impact their ability to um, remain housed or put food on the table. Um, and that said though, concerns about food insecurity seem to particularly acute. So as you'll see in a moment, more than eight in 10 respondents indicate that they often worry whether their food will run out before they um, got money to buy more. And th that was especially the case in uh, Iowa and Kentucky, um, where um, they uh, uh, express that more significantly. And so there's a lot of emotions around here that we that we saw. And I, I just I want to just also give a, a, a deep um, uh, uh, feeling of gratitude to our participants. These are people who are going through this and we asked them to share about these experiences and they did. And they did in a very thoughtful way. And in, in fact, they were, um, those experiences of being able to talk about these struggles were actually quite um, cathartic and useful for them because in many cases they feel it's difficult to talk about these things. Uh, and I'm so glad to hear and thank you to um, uh, Aisha and Vinu and Krissa for bringing some of our focus group participants into the process by having them serve on the consumer panel. Uh, and that's in, that process is both innovative and seems like it's going really well. So, because in addition to experiencing anxiety, depression, and stress, um, many of them feel embarrassed or judged or, uh, when they ask for help. Um, they worry that their kids will be taken away, or if they are able to get help and are able to make a little bit more money, maybe they'll lose their benefits. Um, and so, just as an example of this Hispanic woman in Kentucky that um, we interviewed, for her, you know, she lives in a small town and she's a minority. 
Um, I feel like people look at me strange because I'm Hispanic and I have kids. I know people have stereotypes of minorities leeching off the government, and I feel helpless and vulnerable when asking for help. Um, so at the same time that they are struggling, they're also very resourceful. They have all sorts of networks that they can tap and different resources that they're trying to piece together um, uh, ways to get by. Um, they're looking at YouTube videos to learn new skills, um, uh, you know, reaching out to family and friends, just although there's the, you know, the judgment and concern there. Um, so there's certainly a need for additional uh, approaches. Um, and a lot of it really comes down to money in the end. They just don't have the resources they need um, to pay for food, housing, transportation, um, healthcare, caring for others. Um, and so a lot of the solutions that we tested, the ones that really rise to the top are really around getting discounts and free um, uh, help with things like food and utilities, housing, transportation. Um, they also express interest in getting assistance with uh, with uh, improving their job pros prospects, and I'll share some specific examples, learning new skills, uh, getting new clothes for the job interview, et cetera. Um, so when we showed people examples, they were pretty exam pretty enthusiastic. So this uh, gentleman in Iowa, you know, hey, paying security deposits and first month's rent would be great for the next move I'd like to make. That would give me more confidence, that, that and that would definitely help. Or when we people in the focus group talked about how for their elderly um, family members, they were getting rides to the doctor uh, through Medicare programs. And that was really exciting for some of our participants who had not seen that before. And this woman in Kentucky, um, you know, saying for her, that would sound, that sounds really nice. Um, so Sharing personal information can be a real uh, barrier to, to access and support, but we do see openness to technology. Um, so first off, in terms of the barriers, only about half of survey respondents feel comfortable sharing information about the challenges they're experiencing. And it's both, both about the type of challenges and then to whom, who are they sharing information to, um, and how can they trust that their information will be protected and they, they personally will be respected. So for, uh, and it varies from participant to participant. So this woman in New York, for her, case managers and social workers are not trustworthy. You have to be careful what you tell them. People wind up putting their kids in ACS or having a case built against you, all from something that maybe you said or missaid, and they take it another way. It's just a lot of technicality with stuff, and I'm very blunt and honest, and I can't be that with all these people, except for the doctor. So for her, she had a good relationship with her doctor, but that was not true for everyone. Uh, so they were only really sh willing to share information with trustworthy, trustworthy entities who will both respect them and their privacy and protect their information. And HIPAA what came up a lot. It was often cited as like a, a cue, like, okay, I know that there are certain people who are required by HIPAA to protect my information. And that, that was definitely something that made them feel better. Um, and the mode often uh, matters as well. So you'll see in a moment that survey respondents are much more likely to prefer communicating digitally via text, email, or online, or even filling out forms themselves than actually talking to a person who might judge them. This black man in Kentucky, I think it's easier when you do it online. When you talk to a person, again, going back to the whole stigma thing, I feel like if you're able to do that online, it just makes it less uncomfortable. So let me go into some specific challenges around social needs. First, just overall, we have an overall question, how hard is it for you to pay for the basics like food, housing, medical care, uh, transportation, or, um, uh, or heating? And we see that you know uh, about half um, say it's extremely hard or very hard. Um, we're just you know about 10% say not hard at all. So these people are definitely struggling. We also see that differences by area. So it's much more uh, likely that people in small towns or rural areas are, um, are likely to say that, that um, paying for the basics is extremely hard or very hard. And I talked this about how reaching out for support can often trigger people to feel shame, uh, both internal shame, how they feel about themselves, but also feeling judged by others and concerns about how 
what would happen if they reach out for support. So we, we asked how often does it occur when you think about reaching out for assistance? Um, uh, do, do you feel embarrassed when you reach out for assistance or support? And we see um, about half or more say that they feel that very often or somewhat often. Um, uh, many often feel judged when they reach out uh, for support. Uh, they worry that if they make too much money, they'll lose their benefits, such as food stamps or disability. And the last one, it may not be as intense, but for those who feel um, that they worry their kids will be taken away, that was, those are really powerful stories in the um, focus groups and interviews. That is an extremely um, uh, uh, you know, just emotional concern. And we, we saw that um, in many cases. Um, there are also some challenges around communication. As I noted, only about half feel comfortable. And in this case, they're seeing a scale of from not comfortable at all in the dark purple to very comfortable. So you see that in the dark green, there's not a lot of people who very feel very comfortable talking about these challenges, not being able to find the right education or training, not being able to pay for utilities or afford household or personal items. So, but the context matters here. Um, and you'll see in a lot of cases, I'll just kind of pause and point out that the differences by state are not so different. We do see differences um, in some cases by race, by um, area, uh, certainly by income. The lower income people are within our low income um, participants are much more challenged. Uh, but by state, the differences are not so significant. Um, and so what we see here is when we ask about the person that you would share with. Uh, so we say below are different kinds of people you may, who may request information about your life and your circumstances when you're reaching out for assistance. How comfortable do you feel about sharing information? And again, we don't see huge numbers of people who say that they feel very comfortable sh um, sharing and it differences, differs by participant. Some people sh feel more comfortable sharing with healthcare providers or their staff because, especially because of HIPAA, and they have a good relationship with that provider. But that's not true for everyone. Likewise, some people had really good experiences with case managers who they felt that really they know this, this information, they know this world, they know can help me navigate things. So it just really depends. They're looking for a combination of expertise and warmth and empathy. And they get that from some people and not from others. In terms of opportunities to address social needs, um, first off, when we asked them about different assistance programs they participated in, the vast majority found those assistance programs, including Medicaid, to be very helpful. So again, looking at the dark green here, uh, two thirds approximately saying that they found Medicaid very helpful, um, even more uh, so with SNAP, um, but WIC also a lot of positive views, um, Section 8, especially in Kentucky, um, other kinds of housing support. So when they take advantage of these programs, they're often perceived as quite helpful. Um, but when it comes to sharing information, so we, we ask respondents, you know, here are some different ways you could communicate with people, organizations, providing assistance. Um, please indicate if you like this method of communicating if, or if you do not like it or if it makes no difference either way. And on this slide, you see um, really sort of, sort of, I would, I don't want to say impersonal, but they're both digital and uh, examples and also filling out a form by yourself. These are much more likely to be preferred methods of communicating than answering questions over the phone or answering questions in person. Still, you know, a lot of people are fine with this or it makes no difference either way. So it's not that they won't do this, but there's definitely, if I go backwards, a preference for um, having these digital communications. Now that said, um, many really still want the option to reach a real person for follow-up questions. And also we heard that, you know, getting that human touch also makes them feel reassured that they've been heard and that there will be action that their matter will be taken care of. Uh, and one woman who uses a, uh, um, the food stamp app in Kentucky just was frustrated. It's just impossible to talk to anyone. You can never find a human to talk to. So an app will only get you so far. 
Um, and we saw considerable openness to technology, um, many in their own lives. Well, first off, they're very connected. Even though they struggle to pay for the basics, um, everyone had, uh, or almost everyone had a smartphone. They found ways to pay for internet access or found ways to inter access the internet, um, you know, whether at another uh, location. Um, so they are very much online. Um, and so some of them are already using apps, uh, including some experience with telehealth, although not a lot. That's a whole separate issue that we could spend a whole hour on uh, as well. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of different apps. It's confusing how to use them. And so when we talked about some kind of information hubs where they kind of one stop shopping, um, uh, that was there's a lot of appetite for that. And in the focus groups. Um, uh, um, you know, we, we asked them what they thought about that. And they, you know, for them, this uh, white woman in New York, um, you know, it'd be a great thing for them to put Medicaid online because Snap, he, she had great experiences with the Snap app and you upload your documents onto your phone and whatever, you, you know, they need, so everything's uploaded. And she recognized that you need to have a lot of manpower to handle all the paperwork and make copies. And it's just much more effective to do everything online. In the focus groups, we had people actually look at, we gave them the link to findhelp.org and they took a look at it. Um, and a lot of positive reactions uh, to this. You know, they started to kind of pick it apart afterwards, but just initially, um, here's this gentleman in New York. I thought that the fact that everything, all the different services are under one banner was pretty good, pretty easy. The user interface looks clear with the little icons and everything. And then I love this part because this gets to, it feels personal. It's meeting people where they are. One thing that stood out was that you can change it to any language. It had dozens of languages. My family's from Haiti, so I checked the Haitian Creole, and it looks good. I thought that was a big plus. So they're looking for information that's both useful, but they're expecting information also to be tailored to their needs. So I'm going to pause for a moment before diving into some more detailed findings. Um, but people, uh, uh, feel free to uh, uh, either speak to the chat or um, just go ahead and unmute. Um, so, John, there's I, a couple of questions maybe I can start. So, right, thank you. Anna had um, asked about, did the idea of cash transfers come up? Not explicitly um, that I recall. There's certainly a, a desire for assistance where if you know, it said discounted or free as part of it, um, that was a, a huge plus. Um, but there was not, from their standpoint, there was not a explicit request or discussion about cash transfers. Um, there was also another number of questions um, around, so were language barriers considered as it relates to communication, information, sharing preferences, and were all participants native English speaking? So we did uh, separate groups by um, uh, uh, English and Spanish. Um, uh, so I would say that, like, for example, in our Hispanic focus group uh, or IDIs in English, they may not have been necessarily native speaking, but they were uh, fluent in, in um, uh, uh, Spanish. Um, for, um, you know, the survey was only in English, so just being transparent about that. Um, but um, it was, we had people with sort of range of backgrounds. Uh, so, um, but that was kind of how we handled language. I will say that language is certainly a barrier. Uh, that was a discussion, both because it's hard to communicate, but also it can be stigmatizing, as was uh, immigration status. So there are other sort of barriers I haven't talked about yet that are true barriers. Okay, I know we have more to get through. Should should we keep going and then come back to the questions? Let's do that. So I'll go ahead and share again. And just to dive in, and I'll move through, through this quickly so there's time for uh, Q&A. Um, so first off, I'm just going to talk about the uh, some specific challenges around food. Um, so we asked people, um, we gave them two statements that some people have made about their food situation and, and asked them for them whether this was often true, sometimes true, or never true. And so, and we varied the question depending on whether it was just uh, they were um, solo in the house or whether there were other people in the household. 
So uh, one statement, you know, I, are we worried about whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more? And we see that it, for our participants in Kentucky and Iowa, over half say that is often true for them. Uh, or, you know, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have enough money to get more, uh, about half in Kentucky and Iowa especially say that's often true. So that's, that's a very, um, a pretty severe situation. And um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of focus on not just, you know, uh, it's about a lot of the, how they juggle their life is how to just get enough food. And so they're very conscious about prices and buying affordable foods. And even if they had enough food, they didn't always have the right kind of food. They're, they were very focused on nutrition, wanting to make sure they had access to fruits and vegetables um, that were fresh. Um, and that's, they knew that that was important. Um, and just some of these, these quotes, for example, this one in the lower right, you know, for this one woman in Kentucky, it was just a, a choice about what, what to pay for. Um, do you pay the light bill or do you get groceries? Do you pay for the medication? Um, so these are the kinds of, of daily um, sort of calculations that they have to make. Um, there are also opportunities around food. So when we um, talked about different kinds of support and we asked um, our survey respondents how helpful each of these would be, uh, we see that about half um, say it would be very helpful to get discounts on food, especially food that they can prepare at a later time. Um, uh, lots of people also think it would be helpful to get discounts on ready to eat meals, um, but people like the idea to also be able to, to prepare themselves. Um, hmm. Also interested in online cooking classes and nutrition coaching, um, but mostly it's about getting a discount on the food itself. And also uh, there are challenges uh, that, that we heard about when it comes to uh, 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 jobs and education. And this slide can be interpreted a few ways. And at first, it, at first glance, it, it looks like, oh, you know, most people say that they've got a pretty stable job. You know, over half say it's somewhat stable or very stable. But I think what we heard in the focus groups and in-depth interviews is, um, the job itself matters. Many people didn't have a job that they felt was the kind of job that they wanted or a job that, that paid sufficient um, resources. Um, and if you think about your job, really it's the top response here, the dark green. Anything uh, other than feeling like their job is very stable makes you feel really insecure. So just having a somewhat stable job is not a good place to be. But there are opportunities in this realm and people expressed a lot of interest in um, when we asked people to choose we gave them a list of different work service uh, work uh, supports and services. Um, the most helpful ones were getting assistance finding job opportunity learning new skills. Um, and it varied by state in this case, uh, so, for example, these are ranked by New York. Um, but you see that, uh, for example, in Kentucky and Iowa, getting clothing for an interview job um, was much more important for them. Uh, just to, uh, also interest in getting assistance preparing for interviews and getting childcare while I'm at work, especially in Kentucky and Iowa. Just to hear some of their own words, um, you know, in terms of what would be useful, evenings would be best and online uh, and getting things recorded. Um, so, uh, because things come up, they work multiple jobs and they can't, couldn't always make a class, uh, internship programs were seen as being, being very beneficial, um, and, uh, getting sort of training, um, apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs were seen as really valuable. Um, we also explored, uh, uh supports and assistance in, in terms of housing and, and transportation. You see a lot of, um, receptivity to assistance paying for utilities, assistance paying for rent, security deposit for uh, first and last, um, also preparing for winter or summer, um, within the transportation realm, getting money back for gas or bus and, uh, and train fares, um, and then getting uh, free or discounted rides sharing services. So before I go to Q&A uh, and the larger discussion, I just want to talk about some of the implications we are seeing in terms of solutions. 
Um, so um, first off, there's an openness. These, these folks are looking for solutions. They do this every day. They're trying to figure out who they can, um, you know, uh, get a ride from, who knows about a job, um, who can uh, take care of their kids while they go look for a job. Um, you know, is the food bank have the right kind of food that I need? So they're always looking for solutions. There's no question there. So, but what they're looking for is solutions that really address their own personal needs that are both um, considerable and multiple uh, and interrelated. Um, and so, uh, but in order to have the exchange of information necessary, which they understand is necessary, they need to share about their, their, their own personal experiences. That's fine. That's a given. But it needs to be done in a, in a very respectful, trustworthy way. Um, so the solutions that, that we approach them with need to, to demonstrate that trust and respect and that empathy. They're looking for a combination of expertise and empathy. So to that uh, goal, it can be very helpful to hear from others. Who is going to provide a testimonial to, to our participants um, that these are services that will meet your needs and also respect you? Respect you. So if, you, if your solutions as part of that can also provide testimonials, that model, that kind of caring, that's non-judgmental, um, I think that would be very important to do, whether it's a quote on a new website or some like real person who can uh, talk about how others have been helped, um, that would be really important. Uh, and that while we see a lot of openness to technology and in some cases a preference for technology over interpersonal interaction, they still want a person to be there to reach out to, to help um, show that they're being heard that the action will be taken. Um, they're looking for reassurance and really that's uh, can really only come from a human being. Um, so um, just to give you, leave you some quotes here, um, this reaction to seeing findhelp.org. And again, we're not trying to promote find help, but it was just an example we showed them. For this woman, uh, you know, it was like a dictionary, it just had all these different resources and services. She found it amazing and user-friendly. Another uh, um, uh, API woman in Iowa um, found it, loved it that it was simple, it was easy to, to navigate, but she had questions about the motivation. Like, you know, what's the catch here? How easy is this really going to be? There's a lot of skepticism. Um, and then the His Hispanic woman speaks to the need to keep information up to date. She loved it and she liked being able to type in her zip code. Um, and then um, a, a community garden popped up, um, but then for, it was somewhere in Virginia. So then that's just a, a cue that this is actually not speaking to her and um, then distrust is, is um, triggered. So with that,